I just got to honestly say, Steve, to the worship team, I, I look up there, I can't believe we're getting that kind of sound out of that group up there. Uh, not that they're not capable people, but uh, must be the trombone. I think that's the trombone. They brings it all together. More trombone. Next we need cowbell. We need more cowbell. <laughs> Appreciate the time of bonding and uh, do to know meet Judy for the first time. And uh, those words, those words were, were strong, powerful words, and they uh, they touched me and they challenged me as well. Um, bonding with the church—that's kind of a you know—it's a long process, isn't it? Uh, you get to know people and, and bond with them. You want a time of bonding? Uh, try laying concrete with uh, Jerry Brown and <laughs> Troy Zell. That's, that's bonding time, you know, uh, those guys out there. We had a, a fun time uh, yesterday, plus I have a few pictures to, to share with you. Uh, not last Thursday night, but uh, previous Thursday night, I got to go with the Bread of Life Ministry. Uh, Rhonda and crew down to Wiley Post Park. Uh, how many of you have done that? You've gone down there. Raise your, your hands up high. Okay, a good number of you. Um, Rhonda, they could just show up, couldn't they, if they wanted to? Uh, a great time there together with the folks, and then it started raining, and we were up under the eaves and served uh, banana splits that night. Man, that's that's good stuff. Uh, very proud of my church down there, uh, feeding people. Um, you know, I love I love the guy who's on his uh, cell phone right here. You know, it's like it's, you know, you think does that guy deserve a, a free meal? Sure. Uh, no, let me change that. No. Do I deserve what I get? No, I'm over blessed with what I get. We don't do this because we think people deserve anything or, or whatever. Uh, we do it because we're called, right? Amen? Amen. And uh, that's why we do it. And God says it, and so, so we go. So I'm, I'm proud of my church. Uh, next November will be 10 years, or October? Yes, September. September. Okay, next 10 years we need to celebrate this ministry. If we've gone 10 years, we need to do something special. Uh, and uh, so let's think about that. And then yesterday we had a lot of people who were working, and uh, Ken mentioned the uh, Scout Troop 30. Uh, a lot of help that came from them, painting and cutting and doing and stuff. Uh, appreciate Mel, uh, the Scout Troop, would you extend my appreciation to them and, and so forth. And then, uh, and then other guys were here uh, working and, and stuff. Uh, <laughs> If you haven't seen the, the new uh, teen room, there's a sneak peek of what's going on, what it looks like. Uh, you ought to go up there and take a look. Uh, Cheryl and, um, what's our youth pastor's name? Chase. Uh, whoever he is. Cheryl and what's his name? Uh, we're trying to come up with a creative name for it. I wanted to call it the Peak. I came up with a name. I called it the Old Sanctuary. How's that? Well, that's a great name. You know, Mary, that's creative thinking. But, uh, so that's going on up there, and then some other stuff we're working on, and all kinds of work uh, happening uh, yesterday. So, uh, uh, and uh, Tony's there working on the eaves underneath. I put the bite on Tony. Tony, where are you? I told you I'd call you out in the service this night, okay? Tony promised to be here this Sunday. Here he is. And you said something next Sunday, too, did you not? And the Sunday after that, and the Sunday after that. <laughs> something like that. Uh, so you got to watch it to become my friend, Tony. I'll, I'll point you out the whole congregation. But, uh, so we had a good day yesterday. Got a lot, a lot, a lot of work done. So that's, that's fun. That's fun. Uh, okay. Uh, published September 28, 2010, Associated Press. A new survey of Americans' knowledge of religion found that atheists, agnostics, Jews, and Mormons outperform Protestants and Roman Catholics in answering questions about major religions. Uh, while many respondents could not give, correctly give the most basic hints of faith, more than half the Protestants could not identify this man behind you, Martin Luther, as the person who inspired the Protestant Reformation. Uh, Martin Luther, for those of you who don't know, uh, is part of the reason, a, a big part of the reason you're sitting here today. Uh, uh, that guy. Uh, change the world, uh, his, his work. Atheists and agnostics scored highest with an average 21 correct answers 
<clears throat> while Jews, Mormons followed with about 20 accurate responses, Protestants, and this is kind of this congregation, overall averaged 16 correct answers, while Catholics followed with a score of 15. So that's interesting. So here we are, we're talking about uh, bedrock uh, beliefs uh, of our faith. And, and again, part of my motivation, as I started telling you, is because of, of uh, the apparent lack of, of just basic information about what the Bible says about your faith that pe people know. Doctrinal ignorance. Uh, you have a doctrine. You, know, you don't have to be a, a theologian to have a theology. Everybody has a theology. The basic ignorance, that is. So we are kind of starting out on the, the ground floor, the ground level. My story about finding bedrock under our church in Brookings, because we had a short shore at the end of it. Um, we need to find bedrock and agree together about, about what this book says about what we believe. We, we may not necessarily agree on every jot and till, but, but uh, the basic tenets of our faith. So, there's where we're at. Jesus talked about two men that built a house. One guy built a house on the sand. One guy built a house on the rock. So we want to build on the rock. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, because the time of testing will come. If it hasn't yet. Your faith will be tested. You need to be ready. You need to drill down to the bedrock of our faith so that we are certain what we believe. We understand we believe. And it is frightening that in the evangelical community, and again, that's you. You're part of the evangelical community of churches. Uh, are, are in many ways very ignorant about what their faith is. So, either Christians don't know or they're unsure. Okay. So, uh, instead of getting your theology from the latest rock star who's wearing a cross and says something about uh, God, uh, this is where pop theology comes from, the latest magazine article or book or whatever, we need to get it from God's Word. Uh, back in Brookings, uh, one of the things that I got to do was write an article every now and then for the local newspaper. And I don't remember what the topic of my article was, but I wrote something in the article that said, uh, uh, not, uh, nobody believes that everybody will go to hell, I mean, go to heaven. Nobody believes that everybody will go to heaven. And I thought that was just, you know, a simple statement. Uh, there was one lady in the community, I don't know who she was, that took great exception with that statement. In fact, she couldn't find my email address, and, and Dr. Rowland, she emailed the district office. You know, she found the district office email. I think she was tattling on me, you know. Uh, in fact, by the way, it's, it's a great opportunity for me to preach at my DS. I don't get to do that very often. So I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. But she, she wrote in that email, that she believed that everybody would go to heaven. Well, I wanted to respond that, okay, then you can have the mansion next to Hitler and Mussolini. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't. I really wanted to, but I didn't. I had it typed out, but I didn't. I didn't send it. I didn't click it. But, um, but, uh, so, but that, that's not a statement. That's not a bit of everybody goes to heaven. That's a pop theology. That's pop theology. What does the Bible say? What did Jesus say about that? This is what we need to answer and ask ourselves. So when your friends come to you and ask you questions, that you're, you're ready to, to answer, to respond. So last Sunday we talked about, I, I used some big, a couple of big words, the incommunicable attributes of God. Incommunicable attributes of God are attributes that exist, uh, that he has and he's alone. So we talk about God as self-existent, self-sufficient. He's the first cause. And that he doesn't need anything. So he can't be bargained with. God is immutable. He does not change. He's not subject to mood swings. His judgments are constant and true. James 1.17. He does not change like sifting shadows. I like how the message puts it. There is nothing deceitful of God. Nothing two-faced. Nothing fickle. He's not fickle. He's constant. And he's a God of all knowledge and all power, and I can trust in his promises. So today I want to talk about the, the communicable attributes of God, characteristics that, that, that he created, that he has, I'm sorry, that, uh, that we share with him, that you and I, okay? And again, actually, um, 
you know, three sermons on what God is like. You know, people have written volumes about what God is like. And there are so many things that I could touch on, but for sake of time, we want to continue on. So, uh, but basically, basically, you know, what are the communicable attributes of God? Uh, basically, it amounts, to some, it amounts to this. God wants me to be like him. God wants me to be like him. Now think about that a moment. God wants me. Now I'm not talking about like the Mormon God who will, uh, who was one day like you and I, who became a God and has his own plan to rule and so forth. No, that's not what I'm talking about. That God wants us to be uh, a God with our own world eventually and something. But, but God's original plan for us is that, that we be like him. This is what the Bible says. Right. Uh, the, the God said... Let us make man, parentheses, woman, people, in our own image, in our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all created uh, creatures that move on the ground. So God created man in whose image? His own image. In the image of who? Image of God he created him. Made him fail, male and female. Failed and failed. Female. Made him male you know, sometimes it surprises me. You people pay me to talk. So. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so you and I obviously have these some common characteristics with God. So uh, let me throw a few at you, okay? Uh, number one, uh, God is personal. God is personal. Amen. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, he's not merely some kind of force. He, he's not a principle, or he's not merely the ground of being, or merely the, the first cause. But he is God the Father, creator of, of uh, heaven and earth, from the Apostles' Creed. He's not some kind of passive force somewhere out there, a.k.a. the higher power. He's not just some kind of higher power out there. Amen. He is a person. He is infinite, and yet he is personal. He's involved. Here's a bit of a long quote from, uh, from C.S. Lewis, but it's, it's good. Uh, an impersonal God. Well, good. A subjective God of beauty, truth, and goodness inside our own heads? Better still. A formless life force surging through us, a vast power which, can tap, uh, can be, which we tap, can tap? Best of all. But God himself? Alive? Pulling at the other end of the cord? Perhaps approaching at infinite speed, the hunter, king, husband, that's quite another matter. There comes a moment when the children who have been playing at burglars hush and suddenly, was that a footstep in the hall? I love that. There comes a moment when the people who have been dabbling in religion suddenly draw back, supposing we really found him. We never meant to come to that. We're still supposing he has found us. Praise God. You know? So, then, if God is personal, he must indeed, he has a will for me. He has a will for me. And if God has a will for me, then I should pay attention to his will. This personal being, this, this supreme being in my life, he, he has something concerned about me. God is personal, and I'm a personal being. I have a will. I got a personality. I have preferences, you know. I have likes and dislikes just like you. And sometimes it amazes me. You don't like the same things I like? You're different from me. You're a person too. God, in his will for me, has made me to be a unique individual. And my, my growth and walk with God is not going to turn me into some kind of carbon copy of you. That's right. Nor you of me. And at that point, you can say amen, but not very loud, okay? Hey, amen. No, I don't want to be like him. No. God has a will for me, for my personality, my likes, my dislikes, my strengths, and my weaknesses to overcome them and so forth. He's personal, and so are you. And, and I'm getting to learn to know my people. But whatever your background is, Whatever your story is, you're welcome here. Amen. Because we're all part of God's family. Amen? Amen. 
know, and, and I'm kind of getting to know this church, and, and I look around and observe, and I've seen the, the welcoming attitude that you've shown to, to people and strangers walk in, and I'm very proud of that, okay? Keep that up, Amen. okay? And if you don't, I'll call you on the carpet, okay? okay? That's my job. But, but whatever your story is, whatever your background is, whatever it is, you bring it here, okay? And, and your job is to discover God's will with your unique individuality. And our job is to lovingly you, help you in that process. Emphasis on loving. God is personal. I am too in a personal being. Uh, uh, to God is, God is holy. Now, I can hear some of you say, just a minute, Pastor, I get it that God is holy, but me, I'm, I'm not holy. I mean, of all the, the characteristics you could list of God, you pick the one least likely that I feel like I share with you. I'm supposed to be holy too? But again, what does the Bible say? 1 Corinthians 1, 2. To the church of God in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Jesus Christ, called to be what? Be holy. There it is. You want more? Okay. Ephesians 1, 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be what? Holy. holy and blameless in his sight. You want more? Okay. Hebrews 12, 14. Make every effort to live at peace with all men and to be holy. without what? Holy. Holiness. No one will see God. Well, you want more? Okay, one more. I got room for one more on the screen. 1 Peter 1, 15. But just as he, as he who called you is holy, so be what? And all you do, for it is written, be what? Holy. Because I am holy. I am holy. You see, our problem at that part, with us being holy, is our concept of what it means to be holy. We get this idea that holy means something kind of pure and untouched and without any kind of, of, of blemish. But to say God is holy is to say that he is different from any other being in existence. The verb uh, from the Hebrew verb, means to separate. So God's holiness refers to God's uniqueness, his uniqueness. And so God, what God wants with me, is a unique, separate, special relationship with him. And, uh, you know, this opens a discussion, and we'll talk more about this later, uh, a, a long, fancy word called sanctification. And some of you are very familiar with that word, and some of you are not. Which is good, because I like that. But, but the word for sanctification comes from the same word which you get the word saint. Saint. Now, saint, if you look up a saint in the dictionary, saint, you look it up, and it says, any certain person of exceptional holiness of life, formally acknowledged by the Christian church, especially by canonization, a person of great holiness, virtue, and benevolence. So a saint is a person of exceptional holiness. Let me give you a very theological response to that statement. Baloney. Okay? Paul called the people in his church of Corinth saints. Saints. Read that book. You know? They were crazy people. But the New Testament, in the New Testament, all Christians were saints. A saint, according to the Bible, is someone who's set apart, especially for God's purpose. Amen. Right. Holy, set apart, sanctified to be saints. And so Paul talked about the church of Corinth being the church. What does the church, the word church mean? The church simply means this, the called out ones. This is the group of the called out ones. Parentheses on the sermon. Uh, you know, if... If, if you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ and just also blend in with the world, it's, it, it doesn't work. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody here has got to go to a monastery or a convent and sit, you know, and, and, and sing their gregarian chant all the time, you know. But it does mean that you're going to have a unique relationship with God. You're in the world, called out of the world. See, the call of it refers to the people of every generation, every race, every nation, every walk of life who are called out 
set apart, sanctified unto God. Again, more of that later. Okay, that's kind of an introductory to that whole thing. But God is holy, and I am called to be holy as well. He wants to pull me apart and have a unique relationship with me. Three, God is good. God is good. Okay, and of course, you've been in church for a long time, you've, you've sung the songs, you say, of course God is good, duh. But that, that's, a, that's a very critical, important point for you and I to get. Amen. It is critical that we understand that. You understand this, that all God's actions towards me are derived from God's good intention for me. Amen. That's really, really important. He pauses for emphasis. All actions, God's action towards me, are derived from his, his good intentions for me. His directives for me are derived from his good heart. Every time he says yes, and every time he says no, is because he loves me. He's good. Amen. Mary Lynn, I, I, I think I've told you, we, one of our little disciplines together is we listen to the Bible. Uh, together, and uh, again, sometime before the day's over, we'll listen to another part of the Bible together, but recently we were in the, the book of Job, the book of Job, interesting book. Uh, a lot of people talk about the book of Job as a study in the issue of suffering, and uh, as I was listening to it this time, I suddenly realized that, that that's not entirely true. Uh, the book of Job is not just about suffering, but it's about answering the question, does God let good people suffer? That's the question of Job. Does God let good people suffer? And Job's friends, you know, were saying that God is angry with you because you have messed up somehow. You, the, the evidence is the boils on your skin and the whatever and the tragic events that happened to your family. So you have messed up and God is punishing you. And even his wife said, you know, just go ahead and curse God and die. And I'm sure Job's response was, I love you too, honey. You know, it's like. <laughs> Job did have questions, and he sought answers. But knowing within himself that he had done nothing wrong to earn the torture that he was suffering, he refused to believe that God was playing an evil, cruel game with him. And so what does Job say about the nature of God? He says this, I love it. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. And he goes on to say, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the end he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Now those are two big statements, but what are those statements derived from? Those statements are derived from the confidence that God has not abandoned me, a.k.a. God is a good God. Amen. That's right. So, people... When the job application is directed, uh, sorry, is rejected, I, I can take confidence that God has not rejected me. When the economy is down, I can be confident that God is up. When the election doesn't go my way, I can still believe that a good God is in control. When the test says negative, I can still believe, and I want it to be positive, I can still believe that God is positive. And when the test is positive, I can trust in the goodness of my Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen. 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 And so when I pray, Lord, let this cup pass for me, I can still say, nevertheless, thy will be done. Because God is a good God. That's big stuff, people. That's right. Amen. You know, and, and <laughs> we sing about it, and we talk about it, but if you can get it here in your heart, it will make a world of difference to you in your walk with the Lord. God is a good God. That's right. Consider that in light of, of that, this verse in light of that. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? You see, if God is not good, then i got a lot to be afraid of. The Lord is my, the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, and when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, every 
ever been besieged by an army. Maybe not a little one. My heart will not fear, though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. I am still confident of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord and the land of the living. Amen. Praise God. You see, God's goodness, in addition to that, is a communicable attribute because, because we are good. We are good. Now, 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 the good image of God ha has been instilled with us at His creation. And, and in many ways, it's been corrupted and, and uh, blocked and faulted. But the bottom line is, people, you are a creation of the Heavenly Father. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And, and kids, uh, young, I can't call you kids, young people, I'm no expert. You know, I'm getting kind of along the tooth, 56 years old. Uh, but if I were to suggest to you that some of our youth uh, adorn themselves in a destructive manner. Fill in the blank what you think that is. But I, I think, and again, I'm no expert, I think that part of that's derived from the fact that they have lost sight of their goodness. And, and I think that our, 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 our youth are put upon by you guys to seek some way of people telling you, I'm a good person, I'm a good. And so we, we dress lack of dress or whatever way in a way where we can try to say to the world, oh, somebody tell me I'm good. When all along, you got a finger up, you got a statement? I love it. Adorn, what does adorn mean? I love it, thank you. Uh, this is an adornment. This is an adornment. Uh, these are adornments. Dress. Also. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, I never had somebody, I know a pastor. First time, first time, thank you. Uh, young people, hear me. There's a good God, and He loves you, and He created you the way you are. And you may not like His plan for you at right now, but it's a good plan. And, and you don't have to win His favor. He loves you right now. Amen, people? The bottom line of the past point is that whatever God is allowing to have in my life, I can be confident of this one fact. God is good. Uh, some of you may know or may not know Kay Warren, but you perhaps read her husband's book, The Purpose Driven Life. Kay Warren was diagnosed with breast cancer, something that you know, Mary and I are very familiar with. But in her book, uh, Dangerous Surrender, she writes this. Uh, Shearing heat and the gale force winds of, life, of coming to every life. No one is immune or exempt. Sometimes we see it coming, a siren blows, and we are alerted that something bad is heading our way. Other times there are no signs. Unexpectedly, our feet get knocked out from under us. And we're on the ground before uh, we know it, it, what hit us. In those times, our faith is exposed, and we have to ask ourselves, what am I holding on to? I'm not a sailor, but I love the imagery of the 2003 movie Masters and Commanders. Uh, during a fierce storm, Captain Jack Aubrey, played by Russell Crowe, strapped himself to the mast of the ship so he'd not be washed overboard by the enormous waves. The ship pitched one direction and then another. Although the colossal waves tore at his body, he remained safely tethered to the mass. Years before I had cancer, I made a commitment to God, and I said, I'm yours to do with as you wish. I know I won't understand you fully, and I will probably keep asking questions, but I know you love me. I lashed myself to the mass, so that no matter how strong the winds may blow, how violently the sea crushed over my little ship, or how powerfully the storm threatened to rip me from the mast, I will not be moved. The mast of my faith is the bedrock truth. God is good. Amen. Amen. And here you are, people. Some of you are in a storm right now. And you've had questions. And you're wondering, God, are you there? Do you care? Don't you see what's happening? And oh, I, I've been there. We've probably all been there. Here 
here I am. Now I'm your pastor. What a wonderful calling I've been given. And part of my responsibility, part of my joy, part of my duty is to remind you God is good. Amen. He loves and cares about you. He knows what's happening in your life. And what happens may seem unfair or unright, unjust, or just plain stupid. I don't know. But you can be confident of this thing. That there is a good God, and He loves you. Amen. 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 Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, even your Son from the cross said those words. Why have you forsaken me? And Lord, I stand before a group of people, a, a lovely group of people. And we are here on our walk, faith walk, and some have been here on that walk a long time, and some perhaps brand new. Lord, today, as your church, as your congregation, as your people, we are rest assured in the fact that you are a good God, that you love us, that you have a special plan for each one of the lives here, Lord. And it's a good plan. Bless these people on their journey of faith, Lord God. And help us, Lord. Remind us, Lord, that when the storms of life come, we can tie ourselves to the mass and trust in you. In your name we pray. May we say, Amen. Amen. To the Psalms, <coughs> using the last Sunday, may the Lord answer you in your distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he remember all your sacrifice and accept all your burnt offerings. May he give you the desires of your heart and make all your plans succeed. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Amen? Amen. 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 Shake hands with somebody, look to somebody and say, you're good. You're good, okay? Thank you for coming. You're dismissed. <laughs>